I really just want somebody who's going to aggressively fight for me in court. Is that too much to ask? Filing my cases shouldn't be that difficult. There's got to be an easier way. Nothing frustrates me more than having to wait for my attorney to call me back. I need them now. What I really need from my law firm is someone who can provide my staff training so we actually can stay out of trouble. When you have property management problems, we have your solutions. This is the Zona Law Group podcast with the experienced attorneys from Zona Law. And we are back for the Zona Law podcast. And today is March 29th. And if we're here, it means things are changing. Or in some cases, things are staying the same and just being extended. Yeah, that's 100% accurate. So I am Mark Zinman. I'm joined here with Scott Balua. We've got a bunch of things here to talk about today and get all managers out there and property owners updated. So let's jump in the deep end. CDC. It's supposed to expire in two days on March 31st. This is where you tell us that it's expiring? Sorry. (laughs) So at at the last minute, uh, as expected, um, there was a change. Uh, The change was that instead of March, uh, the end of March being the end of the CDC protection period, that has now been extended till the end of June. So as a property manager, essentially everything that you've been doing since September in terms of addressing the CDC order is going to stay essentially the same. Yeah, and that is hard to do, especially because it seems like we're doing this step by step. It would almost have been better if had they just ripped off the bandit originally. Because a lot of our clients were preparing, okay, well, it's going to end March 31st, then January 31st, now March 31st, and now we're all the way to June. It's very difficult to create consistent guidance when you have these ever-changing, first it was the governor's orders, then it was the CDC order, and then the CDC order keeps getting extended. Uh, In addition, there have been some slight modifications to the order. As a practical matter, it won't change the uh, non-payment of rent-related cases, but it does affect uh, some of other different types of cases. Sure. So the main one that they put in, it's always been if a tenant signs a, the declaration, then they get protected, they're considered a covered person, and they can't be evicted for the non-payment of rent. The CDC clarified that a little bit further, saying that the non-payment can't constitute trespass either, and then have the person evicted for criminal acts, which of course makes sense. You're not trying to skirt the intent of the language ever. I'm sure maybe it came up across the country and that's why they're addressing it. Yeah, I I assume the same. We don't have that particular law here, but apparently there are some states where if you do have uh, this person that's staying in the property uh, beyond the time period that they had to cure the non-payment of rent, it would be considered criminal trespass. And then that was being used as the excuse to file evictions. CDC clarifies, no, you cannot do that. Yeah, but that's still for us, really doesn't change anything the way we've been doing things in Arizona. Um, you go through the eviction process, you serve your notice, you file your case, hopefully you get your judgment, and the CDC, if it's been the declaration's been signed, then the resident is allowed to stay in the property, provided they comply with the other factors that they're going to. Um, interesting you say that about other states is also the thing I think we have that may not be a- applicable in other states under the, de- the order is ours seems to apply to non-renewals if the tenant's delinquent under the Supreme Court administrative order, correct? Correct. It, there's a little bit more protection that's being provided in the circumstance that there appears to be some type of pretext for the non-renewal. There's a presumption that arises that if you file a non-renewal, well, it's done because of the non-payment of rent. So then there's additional step that you have to go through in court in order to convince the judge, well, no, it wasn't non-payment of rent. We're renovating the unit or we're doing something else with the property. Yeah. Or they've, we've sent repeated notices, ongoing issues. You can evict in those cases. Cases, the it just can't be a pretext for and uh, trying to avoid the implication of the CDC. The other thing the CDC brought in as well um, is the fact that the, the declaration can come in any form. It doesn't have to be their form. So what does that mean? So essentially, as long as the tenant makes the correct declarations and puts it on whatever form that they particularly would like to use in whatever language, then it's applicable. So that that may create some confusion if you're may have to get a translator or interpreter to go through the document to determine whether or not it actually qualifies. So it is a little bit more work sometimes. But that doesn't change. I mean, we've been doing that already, correct? We've been advising clients that any form that comes in, if it's a letter, email, and it has those five factors and the the tenant and resident is attesting to it, you treat that as if it's covered by this uh, uh, CDC moratorium. Um, I just find the whole thing interesting, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers do as well, is the fact that as of now, we know three different federal courts that have held the su- CDC moratorium unconstitutional. Yeah, it, it's very strange that on the one hand, you have the CDC issuing these orders, which there's already 
some dispute or a great deal of dispute about whether or not the CD even has that authority. And then you now have federal judges that have come along and said, well, no, you can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And it's it puts everybody into a, a strange position about how they're supposed to address it. If you believe that it's unconstitutional, that I can't uh, end up having the criminal and civil liabilities associated with it, then why should I comply? Yeah, and you, you have to until until our Supreme Court is going to say, and I mean the U.S. Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional, of course, and in, or a judge here says it's unconstitutional. You follow it, you play it on the safe side, you don't run into those issues, and just to, so our re, uh, listeners understand as well. There's three courts, three federal courts that have said it's unconstitutional. The one out of Texas is, took the most broad interpretation, saying the federal government can never do an eviction moratorium. They don't have authority because it doesn't go between the states. The other two, which I think is Ohio and Tennessee, have said that the CDC, as part of the executive branch, doesn't have it. And they seem to almost imply but not address whether the federal legislature would have it. And so it's kind of leaving this... Some things unanswered in those types of questions. I, I believe in one of the decisions, uh, the judge uh, described it as a greased pig that keeps, keeps getting slipped from one branch to another branch without ever anybody getting a hold of it to make that determination of constitutionality, which is accurate, an accurate description of, the, of what's going on. And just a great analogy for any time <laughs> you can use a, the greased pig, it's a good way to go. Um, so the flip side of that, of course, is we now have Governor Deuce. He has opened business back up in Arizona has not rescinded the state of emergency, though, correct? Correct. So uh, our belief is probably the state of emergency is still in place, mostly because that's going to directly affect the amount of federal funding that's coming in. Um, but it, it, it may give this uh, impression that, well, everything's 100% open, we can go back to business as usual, no other changes. Is that is that correct? Yeah, we're effectively going back to the law as it was pre-pandemic. Businesses can operate as they were. Um, and cities, towns, counties, all of that can no longer have mask mandates. The governor uh, has effectively preempted those and said you cannot do it. Businesses themselves get to decide how they want to proceed. Businesses absolutely have the right um, to have masks. Governor Ducey's language in his order said they're encouraged to do so. It's no longer legally required for them to do so, though. Right. So th then this puts the businesses in a precarious position. What do we do at this point? Do we follow CDC guidelines? Do we just open up uh, 100%? Uh, I, I think that at uh, a very community level, those decisions are going to be made depending on the nature of the community and what they believe they should, what action they should take. As far as advising our clients, wh what do you think? Yeah, I think the default, of course, is you still follow, this, follow the CDC guidelines. Until something changes, that is the standard going across the board. Governor Ducey has just simply allowed um, businesses to have the discretion, so it, it provides them a buffer there. But the default right now, until we start really getting more, is follow social distancing guidelines, follow uh, masking requirements as well. It means, you know, the amenities would be open, but you potentially have to limit treadmills if they're too close to each other, for example. And then, uh, what services you have in the office, I think, is always up to the company. I don't think there's any issue with them closing the office or just limiting its use. I, I would agree with that. And also making sure to have hand sanitizing station and those types of um, items available for residents and guests to use. Uh, Oh, one of the other questions we also uh, we frequently get in conjunction to this is whether or not there's some type of affirmative duty to enforce those CDC guidelines. Um, how would you address that? I, I think it's, again, because you have that different, you have two different areas, right? You have the governor saying you can do whatever you want. I, I think you should follow them. I think what we're waiting to see as well is do bills come out of Arizona that specifically s address protection for the companies? And that's what our jobs as the attorneys, obviously, we take the most conservative approach because... We don't want our clients getting sued. Therefore, it's a better process to follow um, the CDC guidelines. And then if Arizona laws come out and actually provide more protections for businesses, that's great. But we're just not there yet. Right. So, again, always take the conservative approach. Um, if there's an issue that you believe that is arising as a result of not social distancing, too many people being in a clubhouse, too many, people's, uh, too many people using an amenity, then that's something that you may want to intervene in. Yeah, and you may have to close those amenities if there's honestly a problem, right. which is no different than pre-pandemic as well. If people are partying in the pool, disturbing quiet enjoyment of others, ruining things, then you close down that amenity for a while until you can get those issues under control. I do think, and I'm not going to go soapbox for too long, um, just because that's not what our podcast is. But it really is interesting that on the one hand, we have Governor Ducey that has basically said, okay, business back to normal, despite the existence of the pandemic, and so businesses can decide. But then on the other hand, you have the CDC saying, no, things are so bad still, 
that landlords are not allowed to you know gain possession back and landlords have to take the financial burden for the non-payment of rent it, it is a difficult position to be stuck in between when you have two different uh, governmental agencies telling you basically the complete opposite point of view on things now one of the reasons that it's plausible that the cdc um, order ended up getting extended is because when all of that rental assistance that's now currently being flooded to the states, well, there needs to be an opportunity to actually distribute that to the residents, distribute it to the landlords, and to get to that money, which is one of the reasons why it was likely going to be extended at any point anyway. The bill didn't pass until sometime in March, or yep. I think. So it, that's it just it's more of an administrative function now to get the money to where it needs to go. Yeah, but it is interesting, though, because you now have, theoretically, if there's a difference in opinion between the CDC, Governor Ducey, and then potentially Governor Ducey's can have, uh, there's rumblings that some of the cities disagree with the ruling and they want to have mask mandates. So you're almost going to have like three different sets of localities, governments, having uh, obviously a different opinion. Um, but that's what I was kind of hoping what you were talking about with the rental assistance, too, is if the CDC was just trying to buy time to get the rental assistance out, that maybe just like in a month extension would have been okay, but going to the end of June is a little uh, a little much, if you ask me. But what do you know about rental assistance now? Where are we? What are we seeing? Well, uh, one of the common questions that we're getting from clients uh, comes down to what kind of um, effort are landlords required to put in in order to assist the tenants with gaining the rental assistance? Well, the bottom line is there's no contra contractual obligation to do so. However, as a practical business matter, you'd want to make sure that you're cooperating with the process Landlords want to get paid for their unpaid rent. That, that's the the bottom line for all of this that we've been that we've been discussing. There's a few more additional layers of work that landlords now have to do. More documentation that has to be sent in. But what I, we've been finding is that the those applicants that have gotten all their documentation put in, gotten approved for it. Sometimes they're getting assistance two, three, four months into the future in addition to past do rent. So this is a huge win for landlords and landlords should be taking this opportunity seriously and you know working with the tenants and with the third party agencies that are distributing these funds. Yeah, it might take more legwork right now from managers and owners to go and help the residents get these things applications completed because they have to the residents have to qualify. Unlike the CDC protections which every single resident get, there are limitations on who can actually get rental assistance. But for those tenants that are qualified and they'll have to prove that and if the landlord can help them, there's a lot of money out there that should be and c is available to be paid to property owners, which that's all this comes down to. Nobody wants to do evictions. That's like such a bad story out there that property managers want to do evictions. They really don't. All they want to do is ensure that they get paid. And so I'm happy to see that more money's coming out. There's a couple cities we've had great experiences with getting right. money guaranteed, and then it comes out relatively quickly. That'll avoid the need for evictions. And I'm really thinking that was behind the CDC's plan. I just think going all the way till June instead of maybe to April seems a little excessive. Right. And I think some of it may have to do with the unexpected nature of how individual states are going to choose how to roll out that money and just taking a very conservative approach in giving a 90-day window rather than 30 days to try to, to try to assist with those efforts. Yeah. So as, uh, as always, we expect things to be changing, and we will update you back here at the Zonal Law Podcast. And thank you so much for watching.